Hey there, guys. We want to welcome you, Pastor Joe Schimmel and myself, Chad Davidson of the Good Fight Radio Show. We want to welcome you to a special teaching that we want to share with you guys. A number of people were watching this on our YouTube channel, Blessed Hope Chapel, specifically our Blessed Hope Chapel See Me YouTube channel. And it was a teaching that Pastor Joe gave titled, The Coming Muslim Antichrist and the false prophet. And not only do I want to tell you about that, because you're about to watch that right now, and that's why we had to give this out also, not only to our Blessed Hope family, but also to the people here on the Good Fight Radio Show. For those who are watching all the time, it is such an important message, and it is very detailed specifically on identifying the Muslim Antichrist. But that false prophet, we just recently did, Pastor Joe Shimon and myself did a 511 News episode, and we'll put a link in the description, where we talk more specifically about the false prophet profit and how all this lines up. And we both felt that you are going to be missing out if you don't have both of these teachings together. So we want you guys to check this out. We are so excited for you to check out this special episode of The Coming Muslim Antichrist and the False Prophet. This is Chad Davidson and Joe Schimmel, and I'm excited for you guys to check this out. Praise the Lord. Uh, the name of this message is called The Coming Muslim Antichrist and The Coming False Prophet or Muslim False Prophet, question mark. Okay, I put a question there because this is definitely an interpretation uh, of, of Scripture and we'll know who the Antichrist is for sure, right? When he sits in the temple of God claiming to be God, amen, and he forces the mark of the beast to, to buy or sell. The Bible says when the Antichrist comes that uh, the mark of the beast will be enforced by the false prophet who will cause everyone, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free and the bond. Revelation chapter uh, 13, verses 16 and 18, he causes all, the small and the great, the, 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 you know, the, the slaves, uh, you know, free, uh, rich, poor, to take a mark either on the right hand or on their forehead. It, and it'll be the name of the beast, it says, or the number of the beast, and you can't buy or sell without it. There's this coming Antichrist coming uh, who will rule the world, and every nation, kindred, and tongue will, will follow him, they'll worship him. He will be the coming world leader. And uh, this takes place, Jesus said, first there would be a fallen away, then there would be uh, the Antichrist, and then the rapture would take place. Concerning Christ's coming, are being gathered together to him. Uh, we're told in the scripture that that day will not take place until the fallen away takes place first, and the man of sins revealed in the temple, showed himself that he's God. Uh, many Christians right now are saying, whoa, it's getting really, really close. We can get raptured any day, you know? And I was interviewed recently uh, this interview was four minutes long. They said I got like four minutes. And I'm like, it's, you know, and I was like, okay. And they asked me, you know, so explain the spiritual warfare behind what's going on with the Muslims and the Jews and so forth. I'm like, wow, four minutes. You know, how do I do this? You know, uh, <laughs> I'm glad I have a little more time today. Uh, but it's interesting. There is a spiritual war taking place. And uh, it's amazing. It's mind boggling what's going on. Uh, keep in mind, in the very beginning, humanity fell. Satan brought humanity down through his temptations. Amen. Eve gave in. Adam succumbed. Human race fell. Uh, but God had a plan of redemption. Amen. And God promised that the seed of the woman, there would be a seed that would come from the woman that would crush the head of the serpent. Amen. That there would be this spiritual war. So ever since that time, Satan has known this seed of the woman's coming and he's tried to stop the seed of the woman because he knew his head would get crushed. He needs to stop the seed of the woman. And to see the woman, well, the woman is Eve through the woman, but then the woman becomes who? Israel. Israel. Amen. Right? Read Revelation chapter 12, the first few verses. The, the 12 stars, the sun and the moon, that's imagery taken from Genesis of Israel. Uh, you know, Abraham, or, or I should say Jacob and his 12 sons and so forth, comprising Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Well, there's a spiritual war. And the seed would be the Messiah. The Messiah would come through Israel, specifically through uh, the line of David from Judah. Amen? And then he would have victory, and he would defeat Satan on the cross as far as, you know, he, taking our sins away from us. Amen? And taking us out of Satan's kingdom through his death, burial, and resurrection. Amen? So Satan has always tried to stop that. He tried to crush uh, the Jewish people for years. In Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis 19, God chooses Abraham. He promises to bring him into a land of promise, which is the land of Israel. Are you following this? He'll bring him into the promised land. That is what we know as Israel. And Israel, uh, through Israel, the Messiah would be born. And he would be, uh, through that, his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That's you and me. 
wherever you're from, you're blessed because God chose Abraham, a Jew, and through the Jews brought the Messiah, Jesus, who died for you, and the gospel has gone from the Jews out to the rest of the world. All the apostles were Jewish, amen, and they spread the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. But so Satan tried to stop Israel. He tried to destroy Israel because the seed's going to come through the woman, right? And he saw that God ch chose Abraham and was given this, this promised land, right? Which was like, almost like Eden again. It was supposed to be just beautiful because God's saying, hey, I'm bringing a restoration. The paradise that you lost, this, this promised land is a picture of the ultimate paradise, New Jerusalem. And this is my plan. But guess what happened from the get-go, man? I mean, what happened when they were coming to the promised land, right? What did, what did King Balak do, the king of the Moabites do? He tried to get Balaam, a prophet of God, to do what to Israel? To curse them, to destroy them, but he was unsuccessful. In fact, out of his mouth came blessings upon Israel, and Balak was like, <coughs> slapped his hands. He's all angry. What are you doing? He goes, I can't prophesy against them, you know? And then it's interesting. Pharaoh tries to destroy the Jews, right? Kills all the babies, but later he tries to kill them at the Red Sea, the Egyptian uh, uh, Pharaoh. Uh, the Assyrians tried to destroy. They led the 10 captives. They destroyed the northern kingdom, but of course they're survivors and they were dispersed throughout the entire world. The Babylonians came in 150 years later, destroyed Israel's temple, right? They were dispersed into Babylon, some went to Egypt and so forth, on and on and on. Remember, remember the book of Esther? What was his name? Haman, remember him? He tried to destroy Israel. He was a Persian leader, in a, which is modern day Iran, okay? The Iranians sought to destroy them in the past. The Greco-Syrian uh, uh, forces under Anti Antioch's uh, uh, Epiphanes, a picture of the Antichrist, went in and slaughtered a pig. Antioch's Epiphanes was a leader uh, leading from Syria, but a Greek leader leading out of Syria. Uh, he put Zeus, a statue of Zeus up with his head on it, right? Slaughtered a pig in the temple and sprinkled pig's uh, juice all over and blood all over the temple to desecrate the temple of God. And then they sought to Hellenize the uh, followers uh, or the Jews into uh, this Grecian uh, thought and so forth. He tried to destroy them. Satan tried to use him to destroy them. Uh, in 70 AD, the Roman Empire, remember that? They, they came in under Titus and they'd been sieging them for a few years and they ended up uh, destroying uh, the temple and the Jews were dispersed throughout all the nations. Some Jews were still there. Bar uh, Kokhba, uh, he was a, a, a false messiah of the Jews because there were some Jews still left in Israel at that time at 135 uh, AD. Uh, uh, he rose up and there was revolt and the Romans stuffed that revolt and, and Hadrian, the, the emperor at the time, Roman emperor, uh, he got so angry uh, he dispersed the Jews even more, so they were pretty much desolate with very few Jews still in the land. Uh, there were Jews in the land through the centuries, but very few. And uh, Hadrian got so angry, he changed the name of Judea, because it was Israel's land, to what? Syria, Philistine, or Palestine, which means Philistine. And through the years, uh, people came off and on, including uh, many that are there right now, uh, Arabs in the uh, Gaza Strip. But they aren't the ancient Philistines. In fact, the Jews had taken the land. The Philistines don't even exist anymore. You look up Philistines, do a study of Philistines, you'll see they were from Greece, Crete, those islands, and so forth. And they came to that part of Israel, uh, Judea, uh, and set up shop there, and they were thrown in the flesh of the Israelites. Eventually, they, they, don't, they don't exist anymore. In fact, I point out before, those in the Gaza Strip don't say, yeah, we were the ancient Philistines that were here. They weren't the ancient people there. None of them say they were Europeans. They're Arabs, originally from Arabia, okay? So the thing that's going on, it's important to understand, there is a spiritual war. You notice that? I went to, I went to be able to get all that done in four minutes, huh? So, <laughs> but hopefully you're caught up to speed a lot. There is a spiritual war, and the war still goes on. I mean, what's happened even in modern times, you know? All the hatred toward the Jews, I mean, all over our country. I mean, even people in Congress and leaders, uh, you know, are, are, you know, blaming Israel and, just, you know, and there's all kinds of chants going on for the destruction of Israel. But what happened? What was World War II about? What was Hitler ultimately about? Trying to exterminate what people? The Jews. I've studied Hitler in depth through the years. Totally demon-possessed. And his objective wasn't just to kill the Jews in Nazi Germany, but he went and uh, took Jews out of 20 different nations was working with the Muslims, trying to exterminate every last Jew. This is Satan's plan, okay? So you have to see the big picture. You can't just say, wow, there's a war, near war going on. You guys, 
it's a trip enough that after Israel's is dispersed into 70 nations, that God brings them back together again. In fact, I've studied that scripture for you in Isaiah 66, 8, where the Lord says, you know, who would have ever imagined or, or uh, thought or s- dreamed that such a strange thing would happen that a nation would be born in what? A day. And in 1948, on May 14th, almost 2,000 years later, Israel becomes a nation again. But then the same Bible, which that's never, nothing like that's ever happened to any other nation with hundreds of nations through the centuries. Nothing like that after almost 2,000 years from 70 nations. In fact, most people, when they, you ever hear the Hittites anymore? You ever hear the Philistines anymore? They just disappear off the pages of time in time when they lose their country or their land. But is God preserved them. But not only that, God says they'd be, become a nation again, but then guess what he says? The nations of the world would rally against them and try to destroy them after that. You can't make it up, you guys. It's prophecy being fulfilled. If you ever doubt your faith, go back to these prophecies. Amen? And say, whoa, the God of the Bible says he declares the end from the beginning. Yes and amen, he certainly does. Amen? You guys, this is a trip when you think about what's going on here. This is the bigger picture is you have to understand Iran has proxies like Hamas who runs the Gaza Strip who are bent on world destruction. Iran is not concerned just about a little piece of land. The, the, the Arabs have 22 nations. Muslims are uh, Muslims, because not all uh, Muslims are Arab, of course. Indonesians, all over the world now, man. They have about 50. 49 nations are 50%, over 50% Muslim. And they're rapidly outpopulating by year by year, trying to outpopulate the European nations they're in. And before you know it, they'll England will be more Muslims and they'll ha- be able to have Sharia law, you know, in England. Isn't that crazy what's going on? Their, in, their, their ideology of Hamas isn't like we just want Israel or we want, or Hamas isn't like, oh, we're, we're Palestine. Israel, Israel wasn't uh, trying to destroy, you know, what's called Palestine today, which is really part of Israel. It's not a country. It's just a territory of land that belongs to Israel. But what's a trip about that is they're not trying to destroy it. And I had one officer, a former officer, when I was in Israel, one of my trips to Israel, sharing with me. He said, Joe, do you know, and I heard this since that time, but it was, it's so eye-opening. He says, you know, if Israel's uh, put our defenses, or if, if all the nations around us that are hostile toward us, Syria, Lebanon, right, uh, and, and the people groups like Hamas and so forth, uh, that are all around us, if they put their defenses down, guess what we would do? Guess what would happen to them? nothing. But if we put our defenses down, guess what would happen? We'd be destroyed overnight. And it shows you what's going on there. In fact, when you go to Israel, you see Jews and Arabs get along pretty well. There's Arabs in the Jewish uh, Senate, you know, or they call it the Knesset, the Knesset, uh, serving there. Uh, But it's interesting, you have this it's a spiritual war, guys. That's what I'm trying to get you, keep in mind, man. When, when the Holocaust took place, I mean, the Jews were persecuted, also kicked out of Spain. You know, God says after the you know, Messiah was rejected, they'd be spirits throughout the world, and they'd have no place to lay their foot. They'd have no place to really call home. Because why? Because God wanted to bring them back in the land. And because they're very unique people with laws that God's given them, and Satan wants to destroy them, they would be a curse and a hissing for all the nations around them. In fact, in Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 32, it says literally in the Hebrew that they will be a horror, okay? So there's a hatred toward them. As hate, Satan gins up this hatred because of uh, God choosing Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the nation of Israel. He wants to destroy them. Now, isn't this interesting? Listen, Hamas, who is the ruling, who rules Gaza, right? Hamas's charter, I mentioned this to you last time, but I need to catch you guys up in case there's a few new people or just remind you because you need to understand it's not about, oh, we just want to be peace, have peace in, in, in the Gaza Strip, okay? I mean, Hamas has been just destroying their infrastructure, cutting their sewage pipes, turning them into missiles and stuff and, and taking aid money, which they have way more than enough aid money to thrive as a people group there, but their money is used over and over again to build these huge elaborate underground temples and for missiles and everything else and our nation's going to give them a hundred million dollars maybe we've already done it guess who that's going to guess who runs them hamas you think they're gonna say oh yeah let's use this for guys they've used money over and over again that's supposed to be aid to help the people to destroy israel but ultimate objective is to take over the world and to create a, a, a new world order, which the Bible warns about. Now, it's interesting. And by the way, it breaks my heart. I see these LBGTQ folks, you know, uh, 
for, for Hamas, you know, for Palestine, cheering and excited about, you know, uh, what happened and how they butchered all these people and these babies were all decapitated and killed and saying, yeah, Hamas. I'm like, do you guys realize if you were ruled by the coming Muslim caliphate, like Hitler did, you would be beheaded, you know? <laughs> Hitler gassed them, but the coming world dictator is going to behead people. You'd be beheaded in mass because they, they, that's what they, many Muslim nations, if you go to homosexuality, you're, you, and it's just crazy. These guys don't even know what's going on. They don't even know who they're cheering. They're like, yeah, we cheer you, and they just butcher you, you know? It's just crazy. So Hamas's charter, their charter, when you look at their plan, Listen to what it says. It calls for the utter destruction of Israel as a nation. They want Israel destroyed. And we read this in uh, a, a saying that's attributed uh, from the Hadiths, which they're the traditional uh, declarations uh, made uh, through what Sunnis and Shiites follow. Uh, the Shia and the, the Sunnis don't all follow all the same. There's many of them Hadiths, but these are traditional sayings by Muhammad and so forth. And listen to what they quote over and over. And this is in many Hadiths, but this is in the charter of Hamas who rules Gaza. Listen to what it says, guys. The day of judgment will not come about until Muslims fight Jews and kill them. This is attributed to Muhammad. Then the Jews will hide behind rocks and trees, and the rocks and trees will cry out, Oh, Muslim, there's a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. So you have to understand the bigger picture, guys. They're not like, we want peace with Israel. You can't negotiate with people that want to utterly destroy you. Do you understand? Oh, peace, peace, you know. You see these Muslims that are in our government now saying, Oh, this all happened to Israel, but you know what? They, they shouldn't deal with Hamas. You know, there shouldn't be any more bloodshed. What happens? If Israel doesn't respond, it keeps happening. It just gets worse and worse, especially when you have a coalition of nations uh, wanting to form to destroy her. Now, we know Iran's a major player here. They train their troops. They, they, they support them financially. Uh, many are now point out that there's evidence that Iran was, Iranians were working with uh, Hamas, Hamas in this uh, deal. It's been planned for many, many years. Uh, they're getting attacked not only from the south there, they're getting attacked from the north, from, uh, from Hezbollah, in which are uh, Shia. Uh, and I mention Shia because a lot of Shia, uh, Shiites have a, they, they, they adhere to a lot of the Hadiths which call for this world, new world order in the coming Mahdi, which the Sunnis do too. The Sunnis follow the Hadiths as well. But it's interesting when you look at the Hadith, and when I say Hadith, that's the traditional sayings of Muhammad taken down through the years. And this is the crazy thing about it, guys. This is what I want to, I think is a trip, is when you read the Hadith, and you read what Muslims write about the coming end time eschatology. Muslims have an end time viewpoint. They have an eschatology. They have a view of how things happen and how Armageddon takes place. But guess what it is? It's 100% reversed as to what the Bible says. The good guys, Jesus, right? Those who are following Christ, Christians, Jews that get saved in the end of days, those are all the evil people. And Christ at his second coming must be defeated because they take the Bible and they turn it inside out. They actually look at the Bible and they actually change the good guys and the bad guys, the bad guys and the good guys. It's what I've called for years Gnostic inversion. And Islam has many of its roots in Gnosticism, which were the greatest enemy of the early Christian church uh, uh, when they taught that Yahweh was the devil. Remember that? Yahweh is the devil. The serpent is is used by Sophia, not the devil. Sophia is the one that used the serpent, and the serpent is there for good. Satan is, becomes good. Yahweh becomes the devil. And they denied, the, the, the Gnostics denied that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he paid for our sins on the cross. Islam was influenced. I don't have time to develop that. I have another message in the past. Influenced by Gnosticism, as well as Christianity and Judaism. But what they took away from Gnosticism is that Jesus is not the Son of God, and that He didn't die for our sins, which is a main, one of the main things that's declared in the Quran, which becomes a war manual against those who don't hold to Islamic beliefs. It's important to understand this because they've twisted the Bible. They've also used, you know, pseudepigrapha, different books and that were fake Christian writings, and they've pulled their eschatology from that, those things as well and just got all twisted. But it's hard for me to believe when you look at what I'm going to show you, how it all lines up, that it's absolutely the opposite, and it actually sets them up for the Antichrist and to rule the world with the Antichrist. 
Because the Bible says the spirit of Antichrist is already at work even in the first century. Paul says the mystery of iniquity is already at work. So for many, many years, Satan has been setting up his endgame. And it makes total sense that you would have an endgame whereby the Antichrist would be prepared. Just as Jesus had John the Baptist, right, in the prophetic scriptures, Satan is preparing the way for the Antichrist with false or phony scriptures. Whether it's the Quran or whether it's New Age writings, and there are many of these New Agers throughout our country, right? I mean, so many people are in the New Age movement, actors, actresses, you know, more than any, they, they seem to adhere to New Age teachings more than anything, and they're proliferating it. And on the internet, man, you see they're everywhere. They're, many of them are being opened up because New Agers have an eschatology too. And they're waiting for this coming world dictator, right? Who is not Jesus who died for our sins. They're being set up for the Antichrist. What one top New Ager uh, called the Luciferian initiation is coming. It's crazy, but this all fits together, guys. So it's interesting because I want to talk about that inversion, how everything's being twisted. I've talked about it before, but I usually bring up the Gnostic or the, the, the Muslim concept of Christ and Antichrist, and I usually hit it pretty quick. And I thought, now I'm going to do a message on it. But no, for years, for a long, long time, if you've listened to any of my messages for a long time in Revelation and so forth, you know that I've been saying for decades, okay, since the 80s actually, the church started in 1990, that it would not be a revived Roman Empire in Europe, that it looks like the book of Revelation is talking about who? Revelation 13, 1 and 2 talks about the final beast. Looks like a leopard and a lion and a bear, right? And you go to the leopard and the lion and the bear, which I don't have time to develop it, but we've got into it in depth, and hopefully one of these weeks we'll do this again. The lion, leopard, and the bear represent, the lion represents Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq. The bear represents who? Iran. Persia back then, modern-day Iran. Iraq and Iran. Iraq, Iran is in Iraq, amen? And guess what? Syria, which is working with them, you got this trifecta going now of nations, is identified with the leopard. The, Greeks, the Grecian Empire was leopards, but it became the Grecian Syrian Empire. Antioch's Epiphanes ruled from Syria. It's mind-boggling when you think about this everything that's in play. I wish I had more time to develop that, but I don't because I want to get more into the parallels between because the Antichrist, right? The false prophet and Jesus are all reversed in Islam. The Antichrist becomes their coming Mahdi they're waiting for. The false prophet, oh, that's Isa, the Muslim Jesus who didn't die for their sins, who will support the Mahdi, which is the Bible says calls the false prophet. And they're going to fight, guess who? At the end of a seven-year period, what? That's in Islamic. The Mahdi and the false prophet are going to fight Christ. But they say, oh, that's really the Antichrist. The, the, the Dajjal, as they call him. You guys, you can't make it up. If you were trying to write a movie script, you couldn't blow this plot away. And we're living in it. Pray for Muslims all over the world. Because look how this guy was delivered. Amen? Okay? Look how uh, Moseb Hussein uh, Hassan was delivered. Amen. And many, many Muslims are coming to Christ. Amen. In fact, they've said for years uh, that the biggest revival of people coming out of Islam to Christ is in Iran itself. And praise God, by God's grace, uh, Doug worked it out where, uh, and we worked it out as well with him, but uh, where our video, They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll, has been translated into Farsi and is getting pumped into Iran right now. I don't know if it's actually showing right now, but it, Doug told me, he said, Joe, it's in Farsi, and it's going to be airing there pretty soon. Against, the government doesn't allow it, but guess what? There are satellites and so forth where a lot of people become Christians because they illegally tune in to hear about Jesus. And our video is going to be in a, in, a, in a Farsi language. Praise God. Pray for that, please. Father, we pray for that now. May it work, may many be saved. So what's interesting is the scriptures say of the coming Antichrist, listen to this. You're going to leave here knowing a lot if you pay attention. And even if you don't catch everything, it's okay. I'm trying to slow down a little bit, okay? But in Daniel chapter 9, it talks about this coming covenant of seven years that the Antichrist will make. And it identifies which people group he'll come from. In Daniel 9, 26 and 27, it says, Then after 62 weeks, and that's after the seven weeks and then the 62 weeks, that's 69 weeks, which I won't have time to explain, the Messiah will be cut off, okay? Jesus was crucified in the early part of the first century, it goes right to the very year that Jesus was killed. This was written 
you know, <laughs> several hundred years before Jesus came on the scene and it happened. He was cut off, just like it says. He'll be cut off and have nothing and have nothing. And the people of the prince, listen to this now. And the people of the prince who is to come, that is Antichrist. The people, the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Amen? And he'll destroy the city and the sanctuary, the people of the prince to come. So coming prince, the Antichrist, but his people will destroy the temple and the sanctuary. Well, a lot of people think, oh yeah, well the Romans destroyed in 70 AD under Titus, they destroyed the temple. Well, yeah, when you say the Romans, what Romans? The Romans were not a, you know, one, you know, specific people group. It was made up of several people groups. You see, there were people from all over the place, you know, Celts and Illyrians and Arabs and Syrians and, you know, all kinds of people. Uh, guess what? Guess who did it? According to Josephus, uh, who was an eyewitness, he was a Jew that was resisting uh, the Romans, but he was taken over his people. I mean, it was a nasty thing that happened. And he joined the Romans and became their historian. He's one of the most prominent first century historians, or one of the most prominent historians of antiquity. He wrote War of the Jews and so forth. He was an eyewitness of what happened. And he said that Titus, the Roman general, who took Israel in 70 AD, warned them, warned the conscripts, warned the provinces, uh, the provincials, not to destroy the temple. Keep the temple intact. But guess what happened? There, were, there was a Syrian uh, conscript uh, from, I think it was uh, Legion 15, from uh, 61 AD onward, and now you're talking seven years later, uh, with, with about 3,000 Iranians and a bunch of Syrians and so forth. And they had such hatred for the Jews Josephus says, and Josephus was a Jewish historian working for the Romans, that they disobeyed what Titus says and they burned down the temple. That's interesting. Because the Antichrist, it says, the prince, the people of the prince to come, the Antichrist, will destroy the temple. Okay, Syrians are Arabs and Iranians are not Arabic, but they're all Muslims now, most of them. And I think that's really fascinating, especially when you think of the leopard and the lion and the bear. And everybody for centuries, centuries, decades and decades, over a century, people have been looking, many, many centuries too. Oh, the Roman Empire is going to be Europe. Hal Lindsey and others made it really popular with the late great planet Earth. It's, it's going to be a European Union and uh, they'll be sucked into it. Eventually all the nations will come against Israel at one time. But the Roman Empire was not just the West. The Roman Empire was also the East. There were two legs, remember? Not one legs. Those two legs represent what the Roman Empire, there was East and, uh, you know, and there was uh, Constantinople in Turkey, the other side of that. And then the final empire that comes out of that will be Ten Toes. And right now, Muslims have the great majority of what was anciently called the Roman Empire. They rule it. And they're quickly taking over Europe. Now it's interesting uh, that it says of the Antichrist, listen to this, the Antichrist, he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. So the Antichrist, it says in Daniel chapter 9, We'll make a firm covenant for how long? A week. How, many, how long is a week? How many years? Seven years. These are weeks of years. Seven years of Shabuah. For a week. And it says, and he'll make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of an abomination will come one who makes desolate, even until complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So the Antichrist will sit himself in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. By the way, you guys, please, some of you believe that the temple that the Antichrist occupy is, is us Christians because of the temple, you know, we're spiritually the temple. That's not what it's talking about. Because guess what? The temple that the pact that's made is so the Jews can offer their sacrifices, their daily sacrifices. And he stops those sacrifices after three and a half years. That's speaking of a literal temple that's rebuilt, guys. I mean, just go look at Daniel 9. And then Jesus said, you know, that the Antichrist will abominate, will abominate the temple, Matthew 24, 15. And he'll set up an image in the temple and, and let the reader understand. And, and he says, you know, uh, and then he mentions Daniel. It's prophesied by Daniel. So we're, the temple is going to be a literal rebuilt temple. And praise God, I love all you guys, but really check it out. You'll see that the temple is a literal temple. And uh, the, watch all the fighting over right now. What do you think the Muslims want? What do you, you know what the third most holy place is? The Temple Mount. You know, when we go there and visit there, and hopefully we're going to go again. We're going to go film, make our film hopefully in 2024. But in 2025, that's when, we're gonna, that's when we've been talking about our Israel trip. Everybody's like, why not 2024? Well, it didn't look like that would work, you know. Maybe it will work later in 2024. But we're going to do it in 2025, Lord willing, 
you know. But you, we want to go to the Temple Mount. And you, it's hard to get up on the Temple Mount. Certain days are picking. You get up there, you're not allowed to bring your Bible because the Muslims are patrolling the Temple Mount, even though Israel is Israel. And they have the Dome of the Rock, okay, Golden Dome, and they have the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And they want that. That, that, that's, that plays into their end-time scenario. Well, guess what? That plays into the Bible's end-time scenario, amen? Because the rebuilt temple, right? Where the temple's rebuilt. Right now, it's desolated. And you, we go up there. We, we bring our Bibles up there anyway, you know, and, and, and have a little study sometimes. Just got to watch out for the Muslim police, you know. Uh, but it's interesting. That it's all in play in the end times, but it's all reversed. Because keep in mind, guess who was sacrificed almost on Mount Moriah, that same place where the Temple Mount is, that same mountain, I should say, the Temple Mount. Who was almost sacrificed by Abraham? Isaac. Isaac. You all would have got that wrong if you were in a mosque. Because guess what they say? Abraham really offered up Ishmael. And he was a son of promise. It's all inverted. Because Muhammad claims to be a descendant of Ishmael. And he claims that most Muslim people, that most Arabs are descendants from Ishmael. You see how it's all getting reversed? And this is our Temple Mount. After Medina and Mecca, Jerusalem is so important because guess what? <laughs> this, is, this is our third most holy site. Are you with me so far? It's all getting inverted. And by the way, if you're wondering, well, who's right? Well, guess what? Muslims didn't exist until the, uh, you know, six centuries after Christ, guys. Muhammad came way later. They didn't have any scriptures. And the Muhammad claimed to be a prophet. First, he thought he was possessed. He'd go in a cave and he'd fall on the ground. He'd be taken over by a spirit. and a, uh, He thought it was a jinn. We get the word genie from that. Uh, uh, in, in Islamic literature, those are demons. And he, thought he was, felt he was a poet and he was possessed. And he, was, he contemplated more than once committing suicide and throwing him off a cliff because he was possessed by this demon. But then he was, somebody convinced him, no, it's not really a demon. Really, it's the angel Gabriel communicating to you, and you're a prophet. Oh, really? And then he changed his mind. He claimed Gabriel was giving him new revelation. He claimed it was the Gabriel of the Bible. See, what Satan always does, he likes to use biblical things because he wants people, he wants to counterfeit. He wants to get the people that are following the true God. And you know what this angel told him? Jesus is not, Jesus did not die for the sins of the people. Jesus, in the first, like chapter 3, I think, in the Quran, there's all these glowing things said about Jesus, but it's not the biblical Jesus. They call him Isa. And he didn't die for our sins, they say. Well, the angel Gabriel is the one that revealed in Daniel chapter 9 that the Messiah would be cut off, amen? In Isaiah 53, Old Testament, for our sins. Then this angel said, but he's not even the son of God. For Allah has no son. Think about that. Allah has no son. Well, guess who said that Jesus is the Son of the Most High and Son of God twice? Gabriel. Gabriel doesn't say a lot of the Bible, but he talks about Christ's Messiah's death, and he talks about him being the Son of God. And those are both contradicted by this other angel claiming to be Gabriel. Read Luke chapter 1 and 2. You'll see that Gabriel tells Mary, you're going to bear the Son of the Most High God. In fact, he calls the Quran a gospel. But Galatians chapter 1, which de Galatians in the New Testament, which declares that Jesus died for our sins and that he is the Son of God. Paul said he gave him, he loved me, gave himself for me, died for our sins, and he's the Son of God. Galatians 1 warns, even if we or an angel from heaven preaches another gospel to you than that which we preach you, let him be accursed. Amen. That's how I witness the Muslims. I show them what the Bible says long before Islam came about. And that there's a, a false angelic revelation about Muhammad, uh, telling Muhammad, I'm sorry, that, he's, that Jesus wasn't the Son of God, he didn't die for our sins. That's exactly what the Bible identifies, uh, by the way, I share this with him too, as the doctrine of Antichrist. The Bible says in 1 John 2.18, who is the Antichrist but the one who denies the Father and the Son? And it goes on to talk about the spirit of Antichrist. It says there are many Antichrists in the world. Uh, the spirit of Antichrist is already here. That spirit of Antichrist was at work through Gnosticism and it mutated through Islam because Gnosticism and it was so weird that it wasn't going to take the world. But Islam, Satan kind of just dumbed it down and said, hey, just deny these two things and say there's one God and claim that this is one true God and come against Christianity and you got a war manual in the Quran. It's amazing when you think about it because there's a whole turnaround because this is the doctrine of Antichrist. Now, Islam says 
you know, Allah, he's not, he can't have a son. He can't have a ch- children. It's a very impersonal God. In fact, love, when you read the Quran, doesn't really factor much into the Islamic God. But this is what's crazy when you think about it, guys, is this. Guess what it says on the, on the Temple Mount where the Antichrist is going to reign, where he's going to rule and sit in the temple and make a covenant like he's going to make a, a covenant with everybody and after three and a half years he's going to break it and rule. Guess what it's, and he's going to deny the, you know, he'll speak against the Father, he'll speak against the Son, he'll blaspheme the one true God. Guess what it says on the Al-Aqsa Mosque and on the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount? It says, Allah is God and he has what? And he has no son. According to 1 John, that's the doctrine of Antichrist. It's already on the Temple Mount. He will not have the desire for women, it says. Different scholars say that refers to uh, uh, he won't have any regard for Messiah. Okay? He'll blaspheme the God of heaven. He'll be blaspheming the, the true God, the Father in heaven, be against the Lord Jesus Christ, claiming to be a fulfillment of the prophecies of the Bible, but obviously it's way away from the Bible. But it'll be fulfilling the prophecies of the Quran, which are really about the coming Antichrist, which they are claiming is the last, or the, the great Mahdi in the end. Whew. And if you want to check out what Josephus says about who really destroyed the temple, it's in his wars according to Josephus part 7, and under the siege and destruction of Jerusalem. Now it's interesting, the Antichrist is going to kill a bunch of Jews and kill a bunch of Christians, claiming to be God, John 16, 1 and 2, it says that it warns Christians that will be persecuted. It says those who are killing you will think that they're doing God's service. So it's interesting. I was tripped out that the end times doesn't show an atheistic world. It shows a very religious world where they're worshiping the Antichrist. It says everybody will worship the dragon, that's Satan, because they worship the beast, Revelation 13. So I've told people for years and years, it's not an atheistic new world order, it's religious. And I've said for years and years and years and years, Long before other people, and I'm not saying I'm anything, I'm just saying it's there in the scripture for decades that it looks like it's going to be Islamic. And here we are. Now, I could be wrong, and others could be wrong because many have, have also been saying that for many years now as well. I'm not saying I'm the first guy that said it, but I was against everybody saying in a nice way, but no, I see this as not being Europe, you know, in the 80s, 90s. I'm an older guy now. Okay, 1980s and 90s. Some of that sounds like, the, when I hear about the 18th century, when I was in the 1900s, I think, that's so long ago. That's how a lot of people look at it. They're like, wow, he's from the 1900s. That's right. You know? <laughs> 1963. Uh, so it's interesting. It says, it'll be religious. He'll claim to be God. Some will say, well, how would Muslims and Jews accept someone claiming to be God? Very easily. What do you mean very easily? It says because the Bible says if they refuse to love the truth, they'll be given over to what? A strong delusion. It's going to be so powerful coming with great signs and false wonders and counterfeit miracles. Everyone who, and guess what? I can show you where Muslims go and basically pay homage to a little rock at the Kaaba, right? So they're already primed to just, you know, give devotion to things, even though they're so against idolatry. When the Mahdi comes, they're going to be just raving. And by the way, if you read the Quran, the prophets are supposed to be highly esteemed well, going to be the, there's going to be a false prophet. There's going to be the Mahdi that the false prophet points to. So it's all really quite interesting when you look at it. Now, this is crazy too, guys, because according to Islamic, according to the Bible, the Antichrist is going to set up his throne in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, right? Making a covenant first for seven years and breaking the covenant in the middle of the seven years. Guess what? Muslims are being taught all over the world. According to Muslim Hadith, according to es- Muslim end times, the Mahdi is a good guy. And he is going to invade Israel with his armies. And he is going to sit on the Temple Mount and make that his throne. That's what they're teaching. You hearing me today? Tonight? today? It's not night yet, don't worry. You guys, you guys hear what's going on here? That's what Muslims teach about the coming Mahdi. Just like the Bible teaches about the coming Antichrist, they're saying he's going to come and he's going to make his throne, not just in Jerusalem. I mean, in Jerusalem of the, of the tens of thousands of cities around the world. Why Jerusalem, guys? Why not Medina for the Muslims? Why not Mecca? Why Jerusalem? Because the Bible says the Antichrist could do that. And that's where he's going to sit. He's going to make his throne on the Temple Mount, where the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock are right now. And Jews are forbidden to go up there and worship. 
Muslims go up, you go up there, man, you hear the, all the Arabic singing, it's, you know, very interesting, and just, you're like, whoa, and you're there, it's very, there's a weird, it's almost a thick oppression you could feel up there. But that's a precursor of things to come in an incredibly heavy way. You see, right now, with Islam, there's a house of peace, and there's a house of war, okay? Everybody outside of Islam is in the house of war. Us, us Christians and the Jews, were in the house of war. Okay, they have the Muslim tax where the Jews and the Christians aren't supposed to be killed if they pay a tax. When they take over an area, if you pay a tax because they get money from you, they won't kill you. Well, that's going to be rescinded when the Mahdi comes, which we'll talk about in a moment. So you already have the stolen birthright of Isaac shifted to Ishmael, right? You already have this inversion going on, and now you have the Antichrist uh, being the, the, the last imam. And it's quite interesting when you think of all this and put it together. Uh, in fact, Iranian leaders are praying for this coming Mahdi. You know, some have taught that he's even here right now and so forth. Now, it's also interesting that uh, the Muslims teach in their hadith, in their end time false scriptures, that the Mahdi uh, will come and it'll be joined by an army of Muslim warriors holding up black flags. And they'll come into Jerusalem. They'll set up his throne there and so forth. By the way, have you seen the reports now that the Hamas, they're just filling, they're, they're filling themselves with these, you know, hallucinogenic, you know, um, just, it's out there. And they're just, uh, they're popped up on all these drugs that keep them awake four days straight. Turn them into like focused, bloody killers because they feel no emotion or sympathy. And those Muslims, you see, how could these Muslims go in there and do all this? Just with this, you know, kicking literally the, the, stuff out of a woman and dragging her by the hair and raping and killing and cutting the kids of heads of little babies off how could they do that well these drugs they say first of all there's a lot of hatred they have okay no doubt about it toward the jews and then they're on these drugs and they have no sense of feeling or sympathy and these drugs are being produced in syria which is the uh, top drug cartel in the middle east right now uh and they're being fed to a lot of muslim warriors who have no no uh, sense of empathy many of them because of that you know and so the Antichrist will be worshipped. And keep in mind, there'll be a strong delusion. It doesn't say because you believe this or that, you won't fall for the delusion. Because if you don't have Christ, you reject Jesus, you'll be given this strong delusion. Because Jesus says, if they say, lo, here is the Christ, you know, go out and see him, or there is Christ, don't, don't go follow them. He says, for many false Christs and false prophets will rise, showing great signs and wonders, deceiving, if possible, even the elect. Matthew chapter 24, verses 23 and 24. And then in verse 25, he says, behold, I've warned you in advance. He warns us in advance so we don't fall for it. Unfortunately, a lot of people are saying, well, those warnings aren't really for us. We're going to be raptured out here. We don't need to be concerned about all this, Joe. Uh, we just need to make sure, you know, just, you know, we get raptured and so forth. And they're not ready for this whole thing. And they're not realizing that, guess what? Jesus said, occupy till he comes, amen? That we are soldiers for Christ and we don't go and shed blood. We go and shine the gospel of Jesus Christ, amen? And we have victory over the beast even when we die, it says. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony because they did not love their lives even unto death. That's Christians. The blood of the Lamb. So we're in a spiritual war. Now it's interesting because uh, guess who they, who they say that Mahdi is going to come back and when he comes back, he's going to come back. Some of the, a lot of the Muslims are teaching that he comes back on a white horse. Now Jesus comes back on a white horse, but when does he come back on a white horse? And that's at least John's vision. It, some will take it literal, some won't. But he's coming back with the armies of heaven. I love to take it literally. I think that's going to look so cool. And, uh, but at, at what time? End of the tribulation. But there's another counterfeit white horse rider. When does he come? At the beginning of the tribulation, in Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Well, guess what? This is a, one of the Hadiths says this, okay? This is by Kabbalah Abar. He's quoted as saying in the Muslim Hadith, quote, I find the Mahdi recorded in the book of the prophets. Well, they didn't have a book of the prophets. He's referring to the Bible, okay? The prophets that talk about this coming, the coming. That, and for the Muslims, the Mahdi is, the coming of, is like a Christ-like figure, okay? Keep that in mind. And they say it's in the prophets. What's well, interesting, you know where a lot of Muslims turn and they find the coming of the Mahdi? Revelation 6, 1 and 2 the first white horse rider who's the Antichrist. Because the first white horse rider is before Jesus comes to end of tribulation and he comes on a white horse and he comes conquering and to conquer. He doesn't come with a sword out of his mouth like Jesus does in 16. He comes in Revelation 19. He comes what? With a bow. He doesn't have, uh, he has a crown, just one. 
Jesus, when he comes back, and it's a Stephanos, a victor's crown uh, in the Greek. Jesus comes back in Revelation 19 at the end of the tribulation with many crowns. Amen? And they're diademas in the Greek. Royal crowns. Totally different figure. And it's interesting because you have Muslims writing that this coming, uh, in fact, uh, 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 one book written by two Muslims uh, 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 called uh, Al Ahmadi states this, and I'm just quoting from their book. For instance, the book of Revelation says, and this is after they reference that hadith about he's in the prophets. For instance, the book of Revelation says, and I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him went forth conquering and to conquer. Okay? So they're saying this fulfills. You guys, do you see what's going on? The Muslims are going to eschatology and they're taking the Bible and they're turning it inside out. And they're making the Antichrist the, the Mahdi. Okay? And they're making, guess what? And they're taking the false prophet the Bible warns about and they're saying that's Isa. That's Jesus. And then the Mahdi that comes at the end, or not the Mahdi that comes at the end, the guy that comes at the end, which for us is Jesus, right? That's really the, the Dajjal. The Dajjal. That's the Antichrist. The Bible does say every nation, kingdom, and, and tongue will be ruled by the Antichrist in Revelation 13, you know, 1 through 5. And, uh, but the Bible also says, how long will the covenant be? How long will the covenant be? Seven years in the Bible that the Antichrist will make with the many. Well, guess how long the covenant, guess who makes a covenant? The Mahdi. And guess how long he makes it for? Seven years. They're coming Mahdi. This is the Bible says about the Antichrist. In fact, in the Hadith, right, we read the prophet, speaking of Muhammad, said, there will be four peace agreements between you and the Romans. The fourth will be, and by the way, it says he makes a covenant with the many. Many scholars take that as being not just Jews, but the many, the nations, okay? Uh, and if this was coming from Muhammad, uh, the nations often were understood of those nations that were under the Roman Empire. Uh, the prophet Muhammad said there will be four peace agreements with you and the Romans. The fourth, which is the last one, will be mediated through a person who will be uh, from the progeny of Hadrat Aaron, which refers to the Jewish. A Jew will be involved in this covenant too, which refers to uh, the progeny of Aaron, uh, the brother of Moses they have in uh, quotations or in parenthesis, and will be upheld for, listen to this, and will be upheld for seven years. It's from the Hadith, Muslim writings on end times. And the people asked, O Prophet Muhammad, who will be the, the, the imam, meaning the leader, of the people at that time? And the Prophet said, quote, He will be from my progeny, and he will be exactly 40 years age. His face will shine like a star. By the way, don't think the Antichrist will be exactly 40 and his face will shine like a star because this is Muslim false prophecies, okay? But the, the point I'm making here is they're taking the biblical prophecies and inverting them. I cannot in any universe, and there's only one universe, by the way, not really multiverse. There's no evidence of multiverses. I cannot, so I don't why I even use that phrase, is I can't in any perspective and false pretend universe, even, <laughs> uh, uh, believe that this is a coincidence, all this. It's exactly what the Bible says. There'd be the spirit of Antichrist, the mystery of nature that would set up and prepare the way of the Antichrist. Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff, man. Now go to Revelation 13 and look what it says about the false prophet. And I saw another beast, verse 11, and I saw another beast coming out of the earth. And he had two horns like a what? What's, what? What does he have two horns like? Are you with me at Revelation 13, 11? 11 I, he talks about the first beast, the Antichrist, earlier. And uh, he says, and go back to verse 5. We'll just see what it says about the Antichrist real quick. There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given him because that's the second half of the seventh, 70th week. Amen. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who are in heaven. It was given to him to make war with the saints, okay, and to overcome them. Oh, well, we're not here. That must not mean us, saints. You guys, you know what the saints are in the book of Revelation? Go to Revelation. You don't have to, but chapter 17, verses 5 through 9. And it talks about the bride has made herself ready right before the second coming of Christ she's made ready. Not seven years earlier in a rapture, pre-trib rapture. She's raptured at the end of the tribulation. The, the, the bride has made herself ready and was given to her to be clothed with fine linen, bright and sh like white. And, and it says, which is the righteousness of the saints. The saints are identified with the bride in Revelation 19. The bride's there till the very end of the tribulation. And the saints are the bride here. And God, and he does persecute the 144,000 as well, Jews. So Jews will be here. The woman flees into the wilderness. That'll be the Jewish nation Israel. We did a whole study on that uh, recently. You go and look at, uh, I think it was, maybe was it last Wednesday? And we teach that all the time. But you have this, this Antichrist figure. And verse 7, 
He makes war with the saints, and he overcomes them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him, right? And all uh, who dwell on the earth will worship him and so forth. But look at verse 11. There's another beast. And he's called in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, the false prophet. You know how we know that? Because it says the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet who did miracles to get people to worship the beast, the first beast. And that's exactly what this second beast does. He's the false prophet. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a, like a what? Like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. So he speaks Satan's words, right? But he looks like a what? A lamb. Do you know the term lamb in the book of Revelation is used of Jesus Christ, I think, over 30 times? It's used in the book of Revelation of Jesus more than the entire Bible, multiple times uh, over compared to how many times Jesus called the Lamb of God or the Lamb in the rest of the Bible, several times more in the book of Revelation. But this false prophet here, he looks like who? A lamb. Who's a lamb? Jesus. He looks like who? Jesus, he's a false Jesus, the ultimate false Christ, right? And he speaks Satan's words. He tells people to follow the Antichrist, to worship him. Guess what? The Muslims teach that there's this coming Mahdi, right? And who is going to support him? Isa, their version of Jesus, will work with him during the tribulation period. Is any, are any of you tripping out on this? Is anybody like, whoa, this just fits too good? Are you with me today? This is just so strange. But not strange, too, because guess what? The Bible prophesies this would happen. And we love Muslims, okay? Jesus died for everyone. He tasted death for everyone. He's a propitiation not only for our sins, the elect, but for the sins of the whole world, amen? We started with a, a former Muslim who became a Christian, amen? I've said before, man, when Muslims become Christians and Arabs become Christians, man, they're some of the most beautiful Christians you've ever met. So it's not about any ethnicity. We're talking about spirit. That's enslaving people with a lie, amen? And you should feel for them. Don't get angry and hateful toward other people groups. I recognize Jesus died for everybody. You could have been born in any people group, and he died for you. He died for them just as much as he died for you. We need to love people, and we pray for them. And I love how that guy said, Jesus, he, he loved Jesus' teaching. Love, love your enemies, amen? Pray for them, but recognize the truth of what's going on, and do not be ashamed of the gospel, and do not be a coward and refuse to talk about these things. Joe, what you're saying is dangerous. People could come against you. Absent from the body, be present with the Lord. Thank you for sending me to Jesus. But what if they torture you first? God, give me strength. Okay? So interesting. Verse 12. He, the, the false prophet, exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes, and it's funny because uh, the, the, the Sunnis and the Shia, they, they argue about who's going to be more prominent. The, the Shia say that the uh, Mahdi will be more prominent. Uh, Sunnis say, oh no, this, this, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, Isa will be more prominent. It's interesting because he exercises the, the, all the authority of the first beast uh, in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship who? The first beast, the Antichrist, whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from out of heaven on the earth in the presence of men. Could John be seen miraculous fire or could he be seen warfare? Just war, uh, bombs and so forth, you know? Verse 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of these signs, which he was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast and uh, who had the wound uh, of the sword and has come to life, okay? And it's interesting because in 16 through 18, that's where he talks about the mark of the beast. Everybody will take a mark, have to take a mark on the right hand or by forehead to buy or sell. And we're told in Revelation that they'll be beheaded. You'll be beheaded if you don't take the mark of the beast. In fact, in Revelation 20, it talks about at the resurrection, it talks about those who were beheaded because they didn't take the mark of the beast. It talks about their resurrection and the first resurrection. By the way, how do Muslims kill people historically and how do they kill people today? They cut your head off, man. Sorry, that's the truth. And it says they won't be able to kill the two witnesses for a period of time, but finally the beast will kill the two witnesses. And they'll be doing miracles for God. So people hear the gospel. They'll finally be killed. And after the beast kills them, you know what it says the people will do? It says they'll send gifts to each other celebrating that they were killed. I don't know of any other group that sends gifts to people after they kill people. When you have a little kid that's strapped with a bomb and sent in to blow a bunch of people up, a little Muslim kid, I mean, what kind of love is that? It's not love. Killing a bunch of people, then the Muslims will send gifts to each other. In the book of Revelation, it has this beheading going on. It has gifts being sent. 
when uh, the two witnesses are put to death. And that's in Revelation 11, by the way. Give me references for everything I'm saying that I'm telling you that the scriptures say. This is really, 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 really interesting. Now, now it's interesting. This is what the, the Quran, you know, uh, how the Mahdi is described uh, in regard to his leadership over the people. A quote, a group of my ummah will fight for the truth until uh, near the day of judgment when Jesus, the son of Mary, will descend and the leader of them will ask him to lead the prayer. But Jesus declines saying, no, verily among you, Allah has, ma uh, has made leaders of the others and he has bestowed his bounty upon them. So the Hadiths teach that the Mahdi and the Isa will rule the world together, but guess what? The Mahdi will have Isa pray because he's the religious leader. He's the one that looks like a lamb, the false prophet. And he will defer, like say, no, you, I defer to you and, and point to the Mahdi, which is interesting because that's what the Bible says, that the false prophet will cause people to worship the Antichrist. Okay, very, very fascinating. Okay, uh, now... It gets, man, it's just so crazy. And I, I've just, I've got to jump around because I want to try to get done on time. But I've got several quotes, which I'm not going to quote them. And there's several articles I've read through, th that have been put out through the years about Muslims destroying crosses, going to graveyards and finding graveyards with crosses on them and destroying the crosses and saying, break the cross and so forth. And, uh, and you know, it's interesting. It, this is a long tradition because they're against the cross and they'll destroy the cross. Guess what the Mahdi is going to do when he comes in the false prophet? Well, they're Mahdi and they're Isa. Are they going to destroy the cross? Not just go after the Jews, but destroy Christianity. Okay? And uh, there is a... Uh, 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 in, this is a book called uh, by W. Muir, The Life of Muhammad, volume 3, page 61. And it speaks of the phenomena of cross destruction. It goes back to the life of the example of Muhammad. If ever Muhammad found an object in his house with a mark of a cross on it, he would destroy it. Okay? The Bible talks about enemies of the cross. Muhammad's an enemy of the cross. And then Sharia, Sharia law will be enacted. Okay? So Muslims, when they take over, they act Sharia law. Do you know there's places in the United States and England and so forth where Muslims are trying to observe Sharia law? And they, they, hey, it's a democracy. And guess what? If they take over areas, they can try to vote in Sharia law. And they're going to want to put the whole world under a caliphate where you have to obey, you have to become a Muslim. And the tax that Jews and Christians could pay to not be slaughtered will be rescinded. Guess what? Not anymore. Now guess what? Everybody will be killed who does not submit to Islam. Okay? Now it's interesting. I read where men were destroying crosses in one of these articles. And these are just regular news articles. Break, they're saying, break the cross. Uh, the crosses belong to these pigs of grave sites. Uh, and then also... Uh, the false prophet becomes the enforcer of Sharia law in Islam. And it's interesting, uh, in, in the Sharia law, and in, in one of the tracts narrated by Abu Harara, quote, All, Allah's apostle said, By him in whose hands my soul is, surely, speaking of Jesus, the son of Mary will soon descend amongst you and will judge mankind justly. Uh, he will break the cross and kill the pigs, and there will be uh, no tax uh, taken from the Muslims, uh, from the Jews. Because guess what? You don't need to tax them because you're going to destroy the cross, you're going to kill the Jews, and you're going to kill those who don't become Muslims. So isn't it interesting that their Isa, when he comes, they say Isa, which the Bible calls a false prophet. He'll be an enforcer of Sharia law, and he'll have people killed. The coming, their coming of Jesus is going to have Christians killed. And the pigs are the Jews for them. So their, sec their co second coming of Isa, so Muslims are talking, oh, we believe in Jesus. Don't you know we believe in Jesus? And we actually believe in the second coming of Jesus. Ooh, they're saying a totally different thing. When they say we believe in Jesus, they don't believe Jesus, the Son of God, died for your sins. When they say he's coming again, they're talking about Isa, and it's not the Son of God, it's not Jesus Christ, it's the false prophet who will enforce Sharia law and, and destroy those who, and destroy the cross and those who do not submit to Sharia law. Isn't it interesting because if you keep reading there in verses 14, 13, 14, 15, into 16, it says that it's the false prophet that causes people to take the mark and if they don't take the mark, they're put to death. He's the one that enforces the mark of the beast. Are you with me? Yeah. Now, what's interesting is how long does the Antichrist reign? Seven years. According to a hadith used by many Muslims, the Mahdi rules for seven years. Who does the Antichrist get help from? The false prophet, right? What does he do? He beheads people. 
Why do Muslims do they behead people? What do they do? They send gifts in the book of Revelation. They send gifts when horrible things happen to God's people. Uh, and all these other, comes in a white horse. How long's the covenant? Seven years. On and on and on and on. Amen. But guess what? They say, what, how, long does his, how long does he reign for until he's destroyed in the Bible? The Antichrist? Seven years. Guess what? According to the Hadith, Muslim teaching on eschatology, the Mahdi dies after seven years. Isn't that interesting? Oh, and guess what? But first, guess who he fights along with the false prophet? According to many Muslims, much as Muslim eschatology, they fight against Christ, but they call him the Dajjal at the end of the tribulation. At the end of that seven-year period for tribulation for us, the Antichrist false prophet, the Bible says, fight against Christ at his second coming. Guess what they say? They say, oh yeah, these two are going to fight against the Dijal, right? Which is our Jesus. But they're, they're Antichrist, and he's going to defeat the Dijal. Christ. Well, let's read how that really shakes out. Go to Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Let's look at this battle. Who wins? Which, and this is the original. When you, you check a counterfeit, right? You look at the original to find out what the counterfeit is. The Bible is the original. These other teachings are satanic and came later. Verse 11. Go ahead and read it, guys. This is in your Bible, man. Check it out, or you can listen. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And in righteousness, that end of the tribulation period, after that seven-year period. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And, his, and the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp t sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Verse 17, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds uh, which fly in mid heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of commanders, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and on those who sit on them, and on the, fle and the flesh of uh, all men, both uh, free men and slaves, and small and great. These are these people that are the beast worshippers, have the mark of the beast. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth. There's the beast and the kings of the earth. And their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Verse 20, And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest who were not killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him, I'm sorry, and the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Jesus is coming back, guys. He's going to defeat this whole system. You keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the answer. Amen. Amen. And guess what? The true Jesus Christ is the one who made us. He is God in the flesh. The Bible says the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was the beginning, beginning with God. And everything was made through Him, and by Him nothing was made but by Him. Amen. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. And He gave Himself for the sins of the world. And He rose again on the third day. Amen. And we're saved through what he did on the cross. And he's called the blessed hope. We're looking for him to be with him forever. Amen.